this is a faculty talk for all the postgraduates and uh, for all of us to learn also dr mahesh is consultant senior consultant at aster cmi hospital he will be speaking on surgical nutrition or nutrition in surgery very important topic a lot of times it's not covered or not understood properly dr mahesh yeah you can take over uh, hello thank you sir uh, good evening everyone uh, i once again uh, thank dr lakshman to join to this uh, meeting i welcome all the uh, postgraduate students my colleagues uh, at ascmi thank you yeah, today i'll be talking on uh, nutrition in surgery which is as dr shuram suggested uh, is a important topic and uh, most of the time we don't give much uh, time in our uh, for this uh, and we expect our uh, practitioners to take care of the nutritional aspects so it is prudent for the post graduates and the practicing consultant surgeons to know about nutrition nutritional facts and how to correct and what are the problems uh, which they face and to be ready with such problems and uh, make sure the surgery the outcome of a surgery is good and at its best mahesh begin by uh, sir I think, uh, the fan is disturbing better to switch off that fan behind there is some noise it is such a noise but till anyway but some 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 other noise i can hear sir actually may i request everybody to mute yeah uh, shivram you yeah. can mute everybody except perhaps mahesh and yourself okay and that will work you can mute everybody yeah okay so okay. yeah go ahead mahesh yes sir shall i continue sir? yeah um uh, i have divided uh, this topic into three to four uh, categories uh, the main objectives are uh, introduction about nutrition a brief uh, knowledge about uh, uh, nutritional facts which are required for uh, a surgeon and then specific topics like enteral and parenteral nutrition and in the end i have taken a few important uh, topics which we come across in our daily day to day practice which wherein nutrition plays a major role like uh, uh, bari nutrition in bariatric surgery nutrition refeeding syndrome then short bowl syndrome uh, and enhanced recovery process uh, i asked uh, at least uh, uh, 10 to 12 surgeons or physicians about uh, what is the actual definition of nutrition and not everyone were able to give a convincing answer for this uh, by books by definition nutrition is taking in and metabolism of nutrients food and other nursing material by an organism so that life is maintained and growth can take place similarly a quick mention about malnutrition malnutrition is a disorder of nutrition or a wasting condition resulting from energy and protein deficiency sometimes with vitamin and trace element deficiency as well uh, just to address just to address uh, various types of malnutrition you may be surprised uh, obesity comes under the category of malnutrition as overnutrition where the bmi is more than 30 various common categories of uh, undernutrition which we all know and we have learned during our undergraduate and postgraduate time they are caloric and non caloric the marasmus characterized by inadequate protein and caloric intake typically by illness induced anorexia is usually marked by loss in weight uh, body fat 
wherein visceral proteins store remains normal. The non-calorie one is the Koshyaka. Uh, this is a catabolic protein loss leading to hypohalbinemia and generalized edema. In this situation, there is a depletion of visceral proteins stores and impaired immune system caused by severe stress. Uh, why is the nutrition important in surgery or to a surgeon? Surgical procedures can cause patients to go into malnutrition quickly, often before we realize they have already gone into malnutrition, leading uh, gone into problems which requires uh, treatment. There is evidence that patients with severe protein depletion have greater incidence of post-operative complications such as pneumonia and uh, prolonged stay in the hospital. The chemical body composition of a normal chemical body composition of a normal kg male, wherein if you look at it, the majority of the body component is water, then fat and uh, proteins and mineral forms a small portion of it. Somebody is uh, not muted, sir, actually. Uh, the basic energy requirements for an average adult is around 30 to 35 kilocalories per kg per day, of which the common uh, dietary products which we com consume provides, uh, carbohydrates provides around 3.4 kilocalories, then one gram of fat provides around nine kilocalories, one gram of protein can provide around four kilocalories. Uh, just uh, addressing the various uh, metabolic situations in the body which leads to nutritional impairment, uh, simple starvation leads to, in a simple starvation or an unstressed metabolism, the carbohydrate stores get exhausted in the first 24 hours in overnight fasting. Then in the next uh, 48 to 72 hours, the starvation, calorie, uh, in starvation, caloric needs are met by fat and protein metabolism. Pro, uh, protein leads to, uh, protein metabolism leads to breakdown of skeletal and visceral muscle, which is converted to glucose by hepatic gluconeogenesis. The brain has got an obligation of uh, using most of the glucose and then followed by the RBCs and leukocytes. After approximately around 10 days, the brain adapts to use of uh, fatty acids in the form of keto acids, which itself is a protein sparing effect. In trauma, major, seps major surgery and sepsis, uh, the metabolism changes and it is divided into three phases, that is catabolic, early anabolic, otherwise called as a corticoid withdrawal phase and late anabolic phase. In catabolic phase, the metallic demand, metabolic demands dramatically increases. There is significant increase in urinary excretion of nitrogen, secondary to protein depletion. There is elevated serum levels of glucagon, glucocorticoids and catecholamines with decreased insulin secretion. Basically, this is a process wherein there is a lot of energy is utilized and also there is a lot of gluconeogenesis happening in this phase. In early anabolic phase, it's usually just from several days to several weeks to several months, depending on the severity of the problem. It depends on the ability of the patients to obtain, assimilate nutrition and to what extent the protein is depleted. There will be a positive nitrogen balance with rapid progression in gain in weight and muscular strength. The late anabolic phase is an ongoing phase, which is the final stage of recovery. Recovery or replenished gradually, weight gain is much lower in this phase. This is just a schematic uh, diagram showing the neuroendocrine cha uh, changes in the body following a disease or surgery. If you look at it, there'll be a lot of metabolic changes. There is uh, protein and if the individual is not uh, supplemented with nutrition, the recovery gets delayed, which leads to poor wound healing and increased chances of infection, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a schematic representation of uh, uh, factors which exacerbates a metabolic response to surgical injury. 
usually the common things are like uh, hypothermia, uncontrolled pain, uh, and starvation, leading to a catabolic state, catabolic state, which in turn leads to a cascade of events, leading to a severe depletion in nutrition. This is again a picture uh, showing the changes in body weight that occurs in serious sepsis after an uncomplicated surgery and in total starvation. The weight gain is more in uh, sepsis and multi-organ failure after some time, whereas in starvation and uncomplicated surgery, it's uh, you know it's uh, percentage-wise is less and it steadily maintains at that level. So, how do you assess these patients with uh, uh, you know, our surgical patients uh, with respect to nutrition. Uh, as you know, right. weight loss is an right. obvious indicator. Sir. Right. So yes, sir. I think we'll just stop here yes, sir. before going to assessment of uh, nutrition status. Can you make a brief summary of what you wanted to convey in all these slides? Somebody had raised hands also. I'll see what are the questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so, so far I uh, tried to convey the message about uh, a definition of nutrition and the metabolic changes which happens in a simple starvation and the changes which happens uh, during a, a major surgery or during sepsis wherein there is a catabolic and early and late anabolic phase leading to various uh, changes in the chemical structure in the body and if adequate nutrition is not provided, these things can worsen and can get prolonged, which leads to a negative outcome following a surgery. Right, right. So next, next is the assessment of nutrition status. Yes, Anybody has any questions or comments about this till now? I don't see any comments in the chat box. All of you okay? Vanita, anything? No, sir. Namita, no, everybody happy? Carry on, my. Okay. Uh, so, once, uh, you know, like uh, in the clinic or a patient in ICU, you need to know how to assess the nutritional status of these patients. As I mentioned, weight loss is an obvious indicator of anybody's nutrition based on their ideal body weight and there are various uh, modalities or formulas to calculate that. A diet history is very important which helps us to know, you know the socioeconomic strata of the patient. There is a history of more than 10% of unintentional weight loss in six months, a sudden 5% loss of weight in one month, other symptoms like anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, malaise, then patient expressing that there is a lot of loss of fat, feeling weak, then uh, you know, edema and ascites, and uh, clinical examination leading to various skin changes in depending on the kind of deficiencies, then various eye changes we can see depending on the type of uh, vitamin deficiency. Common things we see are paler, then uh, you know, ophthalmoplasia, then coarse skin, dry skin, which actually can get ignored if we don't look into it. Uh, and most of the times as surgeons, uh, we tend to point towards the diagnosis of the disease rather than you know going through these things, whereas a physician and may not miss these things. So coming to evaluation of this nutritional status, uh, as I mentioned earlier, physical examination, appearance of the patient, then assessment of uh, body fat stores like skin fold examination or the biceps, triceps and subcapsular region, assessment of protein stores, the muscle belly of biceps, triceps and uh, other supraspinatus, infraspinatus. Uh, you can assess the metabolic stress by indirect calorimetry, temperature, then positive blood culture, physiological functions, poor pass history of uh, poor wound healing, early fatigability, the grip strength, and also the respiratory muscle function test will all help in evaluating the nutritional 
status of an individual. Uh, some lab tests, um, most of the time, they just uh, indicate the degree of illness rather than a strict marker of nutrition. To mention some prealbumin and albumin, transferrin varies with new response. Mahesh, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Mahesh, you are still muted. We can't hear you. I have unmuted, sir. I have unmuted. Yeah, now you can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, but the mark on your image still says you are muted. It's okay, but we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Muted. Uh, muted again. Coming yeah. to Hello. Yeah, we can now hear you, but there was an interruption. So please go back to your previous slide and say that again, please. Because there was an interruption in the sound. I think there's a problem with the connection. That's what a screen screen share. Yeah, screen, screen share, share also happened. Happen. I think go back to screen share, no? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. Suddenly the screen share stopped actually, sir. Yeah. I think the connection problem. Okay. Carry on. Yeah, uh, lab tests and imaging indicates uh, usually they are non-specific. Uh, they indicate the degree of illness rather than being a strict marker. To mention some albumin and prealbumin, transferrin uh, may represent the body's response to inflammation. Hepatic function test may show a decreased hepatic function test secondary to capillary leak of enzymes. CRP can be altered. Then double BC and blood sugar levels are also helpful about nutrition. Uh, there have been some studies which uh, were in, you know, like they have uh, been cross-sectional area of specific muscle group by serial measurement by CT and ultrasonography. Uh, daily nutritional requirements are uh, calculated with the help of uh, energy requirement and protein requirement. Various formulas are available. The Harris-Benedict equation, indirect calorimetry, respiratory quotient measurement these are some of them to be mentioned here and there are still various other formulas depends on the centers they follow but the commonest ones are the indirect calorimeter and harris benedict test uh, bmi also is helpful to assess the patients uh, if you look at this uh, table uh, patients with high bmi require less uh, energy in terms of the weight than compared to patient with low BMI, but their protein needs may be more. And the patients, uh, in the US patients may require between 1.5 to 2 grams per kg body weight of proteins. For uh, ward patients who are not stressed, may require a daily requirement of protein between 1 to 1.2 grams per kg body weight. Fluid and electrolytes based on lab data, lab data and weight and vitamins and minerals according to the recommended dietary allowance can be given. Uh, which patients require nutritional support? Uh, patients with past medical history with uh, involuntary loss, a surgery wherein there is blood loss of more than 500 ml, patients whose BMI is less than 18.5, whose serum albumin is less than three and transferring less than 200 milligrams per deciliter, Patients who have a history of failure to thrive, severe burns, trauma, and septic patients, pancreatitis patients, and patients who have been starving for more than seven days. Uh, what are the principles which guides a surgeon in the management of nutrition of his patients? Use of oral route is preferred if GI tract is fully functional and there is no contraindications for oral feeds for a particular patient. Nutrition should be initiated via enteral route if the patient is not 
expected to be on full oral diet within seven days post -sale. there are no GI contraindications as mentioned to administer at least 20% of caloric and protein requirement enterally while reaching the required goal with parental nutrition to maintain parallel parental nutrition until the patient is able to tolerate 75% of the calories through the enteral route. This is just a rough guidelines with respect to general overall nutrition. And when you come to individual type of nutrition, we can discuss further about that. Now, uh, before we, as surgeons, before we start uh, nutrition, whether it is, uh, especially the enteral route, we should know the gut's uh, mobility and physiology, understand the, uh, how the gut behaves following a surgery. Uh, after any open abdominal surgery, paralytic ileus sets in, which is, uh, its resolution is marked by passage of flatus, usually within 72 hours, uh, which would give a symptomat symptomatic recovery of the GI continuity. The return of bowel function begins with small intestine within hours of surgery, and then followed by stomach around 48 hours and colon by 70 hours. This particular thing is very important because in a day-to-day -day practice, we should apply this knowledge and this would help us to initiate the oral feeds based on the type of surgery and revolve. support. It could be uh, enteral or parenteral in the broad terminologies and whether it is enteral or parenteral, uh, the basic necessities should be taken care of, that is roughly water, calories, then proteins, uh, sodium and potassium also are very important for the normal homeostasis. This is just a algorithm which helps us to guide which patients require enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition. If you look at it uh, the, in a nutshell, patients who have a good GI continuity and who can tolerate oral feeds are benefited by enteral, you know, enteral nutrition, then parental nutrition, and as wherever possible, enteral feeding should be initiated and should be the priority to nourish the patients. So, enteral nutrition is a uh, various uh, types of enteral nutrition we have, that is oral root, NG tube feed, nasogastric tube feeding, gastrostomy tube feeding, and digenostomy tube feeding. Oral root is routinely, you know, on a routine surgeries where it is uncomplicated and the diet is progressed slowly from clear liquids to full liquids and regular diet based on the patient's response. Uh, tube feeding principles, uh, Usually 20 to 30 ml per hour initially, gradually increase within two to three days. Feeding is discontinued for four to five hours, usually overnight. On a regular basis, aspiration is performed. If aspiration is more than 200 ml for two hours, it's better to look back and see what is happening rather than to continue the feed. If NG tube is required for more than seven days or a week, then fine bore feeding tube is preferred because they have less gastric and esophageal irritation. Then uh, types of other types of uh, tube feedings are the gastrostomy and jejunostomy. Various types uh, are mentioned of that, stamps and Janvis, mucosal line and serosal line. Then also percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy is performed by the medical gastroenterologists. They are the pull and push techniques. Jejunostomy, the which cell is the permanent one but on the genostomy, then Ruven Bay, which is rarely used these days. And there is also an endoscopic genostomy performed by the uh, medical gastroenterologists. Uh, complications of uh, enteral feeds, uh, metabolic problems, then electrolyte disorders, vitamin, mineral and trace element deficiencies. There can be drug interactions. There can be infections. There can be aspiration. If not cautiously given, prolonged supine position or unconscious, semi-conscious patients, if they are not uh, assessed on a day-to-day -day basis, there can be salute overload, there can be diarrhea, dehydration, dumping syndrome, refeeding syndrome, and rarely the tubes can cause perforations. The advantages of enteral feeds, like they preserve the gut integrity, 
decrease the likelihood of bacterial translocation, preserves the immunological function of the gut, increases the compliance, less expensive than parenting, and the intake. Just to interest up these things, uh, put it in between. What are the contraindications for enteral feeding? Intractable vomiting is one of the important contraindications. Diarrhea, prolonged paralytic ileus, diffuse peritonitis, severe GI hemorrhage, then severe shock, distal high output fistulas. Uh, these are the, some of the important contraindications. So how do you select a formula for enteral feeding? It is based on the functional status of the GI tract. It is based on physical characteristics uh, formula, the macronutrient ratio, digestion and absorption capabilities of an individual. These things are tailor-made to individual patients depending on specific surgeries they have undergone. And also you should look at the patient's economic status and cost effectiveness should also be kept in mind while formulating a enteral feed. The rate and method of delivery, usually bolus can be given. But uh, nowadays, most of the time, it is uh, continuous where gravity drip by infusion pump is preferred. And uh, coming to monitoring the enteral nutrition, if you look at this picture in acute phase, most of the parameters should be uh, measured on a day to day basis. Once the type of enteral nutrition is fixed and once the patients are stable, Usually these uh, parameters like electrolytes, uh, body weight, then glucose levels can be monitored between one to two times in a week. Uh, just want to know like you have any questions for between enteral nutrition? Sir? Yeah, Mahesh. <clears throat> Sir. For enteral nutrition, why do you want so much of uh, investigations? Uh, because really? experts are like uh, in the in the acute phase, uh, you require uh, these uh, you know parameters to be monitored until we strike a balance and uh, patients uh, uh, needs are met. So once as uh, after a week or uh, the acute phase is gone, then they may be once in a week we need to measure because uh, one is patient compliance and these patients uh, can be are uh, fed at home and uh, we need to see their compliance whether they are giving exactly what has been stipulated or prescribed. Right. What is refeeding syndrome? I'll come to that, sir. I've taken it to the, right. in the end as a specific okay. problems. Anybody else has any questions? Postgraduates, faculty. Okay. We'll go on, Mahesh. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, pa parental nutrition, uh, what are the indications? Uh, nutritional support cannot be met through the, the oral intake. And all the contraindications of the enteral feeds are indication for the, most of them are indication for a parental feed, like extensive small bowel dissection, perforated small bowel, high output intracutaneous severe with high pressure requirements in ICU. Uh, usually the parental nutrition are carried by infusion of nutrients, high nutrient hyperosmo solution containing carbohydrates, proteins, fat, and other essential nutrients through IV line delivered by a indwelling intravenous catheter. The components are elemental or pre-digested form, that is protein as amino acids, carbohydrates are dextrose, fat as lipids, electrolytes and vitamins, electrolytes, vitamins and minerals are also additives. Did not mention about peripheral parental nutrition. Peripheral parental nutrition is uh, used in situations wherein uh, they help to buy some time uh, for you know, less than two weeks, they can be used. It is usually a low dose dextrose concentration with amino acids and concentrated lipids. The osmolarity is usually less than anadine milliosmolars. Otherwise, they can be irritant to the peripheral veins. They are delivered through a peripheral vein. Usually, this can be used in uh, uh, KP patients uh, uh, during a short span, but is 
uh, you know, less than two weeks. They may last. They may not last longer. Uh, coming to total parental nutrition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it involves uh, high dextrose concentration, amino acids, osmolality of between 1000 to 1900 milliosmolars per liter. It is usually provided through a percutaneously inserted catheter, a continuous slow infusion throughout the day, uh, throughout the day or over a period of 8 to 12 hours at night typically so that patients can uh, in the mornings can uh, get back to their routine activities wherever indicated. What are the principles of total parental nutrition? The important principle is the TPN is calculated for a requirement for over 24 hours. Uh, it has to be the protein requirement should be determined on an individual basis per in grams per kg body weight. Uh, then calories as well determine the percentage to be given as proteins and carbohydrates and fat and includes electrolytes and trace elements. A co-administration of lipids to prevent fatty acid deficiencies should bear in mind lipids gives more calories in less volume. Uh, various compositions are available in the market. Some to mention here standard parental dextrose solution, intravenous lipid emulsions. Uh, the popular one is the three-in-one solution uh, which uh, most of the intensive care patients are, are fed uh, these days. Just to mention about the three-in-one solution, uh, generally administered uh, these days, it is generally administered three-in-one admixture. It is protein as amino acids, carbohydrates as dextrose, fat as lipid emulsions of soya beans, safflower or olive oil. Alternatively, lipid emulsions can be administered as separate IV piggyback infusion. Patients who are not stressed will need 0.75 grams per kg per ideal body weight of a protein per day. Additives like rights, uh, medications, vitamins, and trace elements can also be added daily along with the TPN. Uh, coming to complications, uh, usually they are immediate and uh, early and late complications. Immediate complications are due to the procedure itself like malpositioning of the tube, hemothorax, pneumothorax, then puncture of the subclavian vessel. In the first two weeks, there can be catheter displacement, catheter thrombosis, then can be, the can, patients can have hyperglycemic coma, severe acid-base imbalance, and the infusion of the catheter. In the later stage, there can be problems like uh, vitamin and trace element deficiency, essential fat acid deficiency, then metabolic bone diseases, nephrolithiasis, cholestasis leading to cholelithiasis and infection is throughout the as long as the tube is there patients can have infection which in turn can lead to sepsis or can lead to uh, fever and other related problems uh, how to prevent these uh, complications of problems is uh, correct the electrolyte abnormalities before starting nutrition it's very important that if there are uh, severe electrolyte imbalance and they need to be corrected separately uh, before uh, we initiate uh, TPN. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to correct uh, already abnormal electrolytes by adding uh, uh, electrolytes into the TPN bag. And these, once corrected and the TPN is started, they should be continuously monitored and repleted aggressively. Uh, there's always a slow rate initiation should be practiced with advanced slowly in patients who are at high risk, and also we should prevent overfeeding. So how should we monitor these patients? Uh, as soon as the tube is inserted, a chest X-ray, vital signs should be monitored because sometimes the tube can be very much uh, in, inside the heart, uh, daily weight measurement, side care is important. Then uh, GRBS should be measured three times uh, uh, three times daily, electrolytes on a daily basis, calcium and uh, trace elements should be uh, checked twice a week, uh, left T and albumin should be checked twice a week, and HP total count INR can be checked on a weekly basis, urine for glycosuria again should be checked on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so this uh, completes uh, the uh, uh, discussion or uh, talk about uh, the uh, nutritional, you know, like uh, enteral and parental nutrition. Uh, I'm just going to move to specific uh, problems 
related to, uh, to nu nutrition, whether it is enteral or parenteral, which we come across uh, commonly in our practice. Any questions with the Mm. Dr. Madan's question, Dr. Lakshman has already answered. Anybody else has any doubts? I think you have cleared all the doubts, Mahesh. Very clear. Okay, I think we'll talk, I will take questions and comments at the end. We go ahead with the talk. Mahesh, carry on. Uh, related to uh, seriously, it's a short syndrome where it's massive. You have to do a surface in time. Mahesh, we have lost you. Hello. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, we can hear you. Am I audible? Screen okay. share. Presentation not seen. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. It's yes, visible now, sir. Yes. Okay. You are not seen. Uh, Carry on. Uh, and our specific surgeries. Uh, which require uh, specific addition by nutrition. Uh, is one is uh, short bowl or small. Uh, the increase in size of face to decrease and there is gastric acid. And also should be started. Yes, I think you soon output video uh, to rep. And also it is stopped. No, you can talk now because there is some low connection, I think. You stop the video only, audio is enough. Mahesh, I'm audible. Sir. Yeah. Presentation. Mahesh, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, you are audible. You mute your video because connection is poor. Only audio yes, can talk. I think that will be better. Uh, can I continue, sir? Yeah, continue. So, to treatment of uh, short ball syndrome, there is an adequate treatment. Hybrids, electric receptor antagonist. Uh, should be started as output is uh, in the ml per day. Uh, glutamine and triglycerides uh, to make things should be given to the patients. Oral feeds, diet rich in complex Mesh, can you hear me? B12 should be given, uh, sir. I can hear you, sir. No, your yes, presentation sir. is not seen. 
what you have to do is you have to mute your video i can't do that from here but audio let it be there okay, to the presentation share the screen and also talk audible scenes yes am i audible sir yes continue okay sir uh, so short pole syndrome it is a, a can happen in massive resection of small bowel with the decreased intestinal surface area and decreased uh, intestinal uh, transit time leading to malnutrition uh, there is gastric acid hypersecretion again leading to uh, decreased absorption there can be various uh, metabolic uh, changes leading to lactic acidosis and uh, other changes like uh, patients can develop nephrolithiasis so how to treat short bowel syndrome uh, nutritionally is uh, there should be adequate replacement of iv fluids electrolytes zinc and hcl super antagonist antagonist enter feeding should be started as soon as possible once the stool output is uh, less than 1000 uh, ml per day uh, glutamine and medium chain triglycerides to maintain the mucosal healing should be given the feed should be small frequent and uh, should be rich in complex carbohydrates wherever there is resection of the terminal ileum the patient should be supplemented with uh, vitamin b12 on a regular basis uh, refeeding syndrome it is a potential lethal complication in patient who are severely malnourished and this happens once they have started feed once they are fed this can lead to hypophosphatemia hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia uh, which can lead to alteration in magnesium and thiamine as got harmful effect on heart uh, respiratory system and liver and neuromuscular system they can lead to sudden cardiac arrest with paralysis of the muscle and respiratory depression Uh, nutrition in coming to nutrition in bariatric surgery nutrition in bariatric surgery is unique they are addressed uh, pre and post operatively based on the individual needs post bariatric surgery the transitional diet emphasis small meals without added sugars avoid stretching of the pouch and dumping in uh, diet is a progressive kind of from clear liquids patient reach a regular bariatric diet by approximately 6 weeks the meal should be in the small 3 uh, to 5 small uh, meals uh, daily per day or uh, slowly over a period of minutes chewing food longer and avoid drinking beverages at the same time excuse me the product 25% of intake fat should provide around 25 and carbohydrates around 50% of the total diet but make sure they are there is no simple sugars in it supplementation with chewable multivitamins and minerals additional supplementation with calcium and b12 and iron may also be required uh, just to mention about uh, enhanced uh, recovery surgery this is a multimodal perioperative care pathway where an emphasis is given to uh, optimization of nutrition by pre and perioperative counseling there in most some of the surgeries uh, there is an early enteral feeding started with a specific kind of uh, diet and this helps in uh, early mobilization and shorter hospital stay with reducing uh, post operative there have been studies which shows the post operative complications are reduced by 50% and slowly uh, many different surgeries can be uh, done in this uh, uh, platform and uh, the the results are achieved in a better manner than the conventional method uh, this uh, i end my uh, topic here uh, before uh, we can take any questions sir any questions so thank you mahesh hello so I still uh, have to conclude i have not concluded Uh, any questions up to here sir mm finish your conclusion okay sir
uh, take home message uh, the outcome of surgery uh, to the nutrition status prior to and after surgery that means minerals and proteins are vital to the healing process uh, for a day to day uh, practice and uh, for any you know surgical procedure which lasts uh, more than half an hour a general advice like eating uh, five to three to five servings of fruits and vegetables every day to eat six to eleven servings of uh, whole grain food every day to eat variety of protein containing food at meals and snacks uh, to use and oil and sweet sparingly to drink adequately uh, plenty of water and uh, to go grocery one week before surgery so that you can pick and choose what you want to eat following any surgery and most of and to get some exercise and wherever uh, there is a problem better to involve the registered dietitian and it is better to be it is better to prescribe both nutrition and exercise rather than just having a oral discussion uh, to conclude nutritional supplementation that is the risk of complication if given to malnourished patient undergoing major surgical procedures uh, there is no specific requirement for patient who are otherwise healthy enteral fading should be the first choice wherever supplementation is required parental nutrition is an important armamentarium however it has to be carefully monitored overfeeding is very harmful and we have seen various areas where they can cause serious problems a thorough understanding of metabolism and its influence is necessary for a surgeon to assess the adequacy of their patients and for a better outcome thank you all for your attention yeah i think now any questions and comments there are from okay which vein must be preferred for total parental nutrition and why madan is asking mahesh hello which vein must be yeah, usually the tpn and why the subclavian is better whether it is in the non movement area of the patient and has got uh, less problem if it is uh, applied by a expert person they uh, have less problems and, and patient can continue their uh, routine activities mobility is not hampered uh, so it's better to have a subclavian vein right why i think uh, vanita has asked ask uh, clarified it's a hyperosmolar solution peripheral line it cannot go okay yeah. anyone else no other questions post graduates dr lakshman sir yeah very nicely done mahesh congratulations i think you covered a very wide topic very nicely if i may add to what yeah if i may add to what you have said albumin is a good indicator of a nutritional status in a non septic state it becomes less reliable if somebody is septic because it artificially brings down the albumin the other areas where albumin yes. is not dependable are you know protein losing nephropathy a patient with nephrotic syndrome for example in which case you can't depend on yes. albumin and transferrin would probably be a better indicator okay. in these septic patients and as mahesh said i would like to reiterate in any yeah in, in and uh, i would like to reiterate mahesh has mentioned it hello that yeah any patient with either sepsis major trauma or major resection i think every surgeon must consider putting a feeding jejunostomy in when he has done a laparotomy or a laparoscopy put a feeding jejunostomy in because you have access to the small bowel which as mahesh said has practically no ileus you can start giving them feeds from the very next day onwards it's more yes, physiological sir. it is cheaper and another very important thing is it was mentioned briefly but uh, not stressed if you keep a patient on keep in for a long time you have a very real risk of a calculus cholecystitis yes, and so sir. even if somebody is npo put a little bit of egg flip the fat is important Yes. at least 10 20 ml of egg flip into somebody's rice 
attitude, even if he's got an alias, because that keeps the cholecystokine kind in going, it keeps the gallbladder functioning, and you can reduce the chances of it in a in a, a calculus cholecystitis. Cholecystitis. Yes. Yeah. Cholestasis leading to a calculus cholestasis. Correct. Correct. So, but again, to as as Mahesh concluded correctly, I think our residents must always think about nutrition. Uh, surgeons are always good operators. They can always learn to do big yes. resections quickly. But what decides the success? versus failure of surgery is metabolic support and nutrition yes, yes. heads the list in metabolic support. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Dr. Lakshman. Thank you. If I can add, I think uh, another area which is very important is prehabilitation or uh, patients whom we think they are good they may not be really good to operate or recover post-operatively. We may have to, we, there is no harm taking some time and improve their nutrition condition unless it's an emergency to, and then operate. Then definitely the post-operative results are much better. Many of the cancer patients we see, they are poorly nourished and they might have received chemotherapy or radiotherapy preoperatively. So I think we should take a little time to improve their nutrition and then operate. Then instead of we suffering post-surgery, we can improve them and then operate. The results will be much better. Um, yes. Is here Dr. Darshan is there? Darshan, you can unmute. So another, uh, I don't know how many of you use it. T-tube is a good uh, tube for you putting feeding jejunostomy. It's very simple, fast, and uh, quite effective. Instead of putting the long tube, a uh, lot of, we also put the rails, sorry, T-tube. T-tube is more used for the feeding jejunostomy than putting it into the bile duct nowadays. Anybody has comment on that? Another way of doing uh, jejun feeding jejunostomy is radiologists do it percutaneous under the guidance of the CT they can put if, if necessary a feeding jejunostomy radiological guided percutaneous. Okay, any other comments, please? Um, Madan wants to know prevention of refeeding syndrome. How do you prevent refeeding syndrome? Uh, basically, it has to go slow and uh, thorough monitoring is required and uh, severely malnourished patient usually happens. So it should not be aggressively be treating with them with the TPN or enteral feed. So we uh, need to have a baseline uh, electrolytes of those patients and also and then take it forward. Uh, so it's slow and steady will help to prevent the refugee syndrome and accordingly the electrolyte imbalances should be corrected. Right. Thank you, Mesh. I think uh, that's all. Um, it was a nice presentation, uh, quite vast. Really. I think postgraduates will be benefited by this. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.